All right, it is the church history class. Uh, this is class number 20, the English Reformation, part one. We are on uh, the 22nd of September, 2020. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for the comments on all of your uh, class questions. Thank you for sticking with us and um, wandering along in this wonderful maze called the European Reformation. Bishop, if we can all mute, that would be better. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll mute all. Oh, okay. I, I'll do it. Okay, I got everybody off except me. There we go. So yeah, that makes a better sound. Um, and we should start with a prayer. Let me start with a prayer. I'll say, can anybody give me an amen? And nobody can do that because I got you all shut up. So hang on a second. For the church. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church, that thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth and all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of him who died and rose again, and ever liveth to make intercession for us, Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Welcome again, everybody. Uh, we start on our favorite part of this whole harangue, the English Reformation. I hope it's your favorite part, because it pertains to us closely. The English Reformation could be seen pretty easily as a train wreck. Not to, I shouldn't say that while Bishop Ashman is traveling in a train, but a, a plane crash, um, an accident of politics all mixed up together with religion, an inevitable reform of a corrupt theology and very corrupted organization, a mere societal and cultural overgrowth or outgrowth, an echo of what was already happening elsewhere, a return to a more pure and faithful church, a compromise between warring factions, or a steadily moving dot on an ever-changing background of influences. And any of these, perhaps all of them, could be true. But those men and women who found themselves at the levers of great change in a land so uniquely given an island empire, and in the 16th century an emerging world empire as well, give us a set of personal windows on the events that resulted in the laboratory in which a fully Catholic Anglican church could be born. If that's a right term, this newborn baby was already 1500 years old. And it begs the question, what is Anglicanism? Surely by 2020 AD, that question is asked and answered. And yet even today, what one person means by Anglican is miles apart from the definition given by another. Technically, it is the faith and practice of the Church of England and its offshoots, born in the first or second century, subject to Celtic and Roman expressions and authorities, as we've seen, overlies of, overlays of Germanic, French, Nordic, Irish cultural incursions. A curt answer could be whatever is a religion of the British sovereign, but that, excuse me, letting somebody in, but that crowned head, uh, that crowned head becomes a Presbyterian whenever he's vacationing in Scotland. For our purposes, our purposes, seeing who we are, Anglicanism is that hoped for balance and bridge, combining both ancient forms and class, classical theology, as yet as, as current and relevant as today. It is a faithful remnant of the church of the great councils, the church fathers, deep thinkers, and educated Christians of many ages, expressing in the best English what we deeply believe about God. It contains all the Catholic sacraments, maintains the threefold holy orders, validly maintaining the apostolic succession from St. John, allows for monastic solitude, and a calendar of richly laid celebrations marking each year and sanctifying time. The seeds of this balanced Christianity were already long sown in the church that Henry VIII tutor 
inherited. How he affected that church history has shown us. But the last thing we should ever agree to is that Roman slander that we were created by Henry VIII when all he wanted was to divorce his Catholic wife. Oh, Henry. Henry VIII was next in line for the English throne after the death of his brother, Arthur, ended that heir's expectation of monarchy. With their father, Henry VII, still alive and on the throne, it was proposed that Catherine of Aragon, Arthur's widow, marry Henry instead, after his brother's death. This would require a papal dispensation because the Marriage of a brother's wife was illegal under the church rules against consanguinity. Though Catherine and Arthur actually never consummated their marriage, it was still seen as a legal fact, and at the time, it was illegal and immoral to pursue the match. The papers that were sent to Rome and the dispensation which was sent from Rome assumed that Catherine's marriage to Aragon, or Arthur was consummated the English insisted on adding this clause to cover all possible objections to the dispensation. Catherine wrote at that time to Ferdinand and Isabella, her parents, protesting this clause, saying that the marriage had not been consummated. This disagreement about the consummation of Catherine's first marriage was later to become important. Henry VIII stipulated that he would only consider the marriage and papal dispensation if God would provide him a male heir through the union. He had seen the devastation of his country and its nobles through the recent wars of succession and never wanted there to be a, a struggle like that again. Ironically, the only male heir Henry would have was a mere boy when he died and his two daughters, both strong characters, took the nation in two fully different directions and with violence. Pope Julius II granted dispensation for them. Excuse me. Pope Julius II granted dispensation for them to marry. But for five years, Henry and Catherine were only engaged. While his father, Henry VII, remained alive as king, they didn't marry. In 1509, Henry VIII took the throne and married Catherine. Henry VIII, as was said, earnestly wanted a male heir knowing his family's claim to the throne was only a generation old and that the War of the Roses had destroyed most of the royal lines in England. He made it his condition of marriage to Catherine that she must produce him a son and male heir. It's a strange idea, but that was what it was. But the marriage of Henry VIII and Catherine produced only Mary Tudor, born in 1516. All other children, boys included, died in infancy or before birth. By most accounts, Henry and Catherine's marriage was generally a happy or at least peaceful one through most of their years together, aside from the tragedies of miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant death. There were many indications of their devotion to each other. Catherine kept a separate household with some 140 people on the staff, but separate households was the norm for royal couples. Despite that, Catherine was noted for personally ironing her husband's shirts. Catherine tended to prefer to associate with scholars over participating in the social life of the court. She was known as a generous supporter of learning and was also generous to the poor. Among the institutions she supported were Queen's College and St. John's College. Erasmus, who visited England in 1514, praised Catherine highly. Catherine commissioned Juan Luis Vives to come to England to complete one book and then write another, which made recommendations for the education of women. Vives became a tutor for Princess Mary. As her mother had overseen her education, Catherine saw to it that her daughter Mary was well-educated. Among her religious projects, she supported the observant Franciscans. That Henry valued Catherine and the marriage in their early years is attested to by the many love knots made up of their initials, which decorate several of their homes and were even used to decorate his armor. 
Henry was a strong Catholic. He took his faith seriously. When Luther wrote against the sacramental system in the Babylonian captivity, Henry VIII wrote a rebuttal, earning him the Pope's title, Defender of the Faith. By 1524, Henry VIII was totally discouraged with Catherine and was carried on, carrying on with Anne Boleyn. He saw Catherine's failure to give him a son as a divine judgment against the illegal marriage of his brother's, brother's widow. Um, I'll just interject this. If you ever get a chance to rent the, the uh, miniseries Wolf Hall, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it's really excellently done. It focuses around the, the person of Thomas uh, oh, um, Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell was, was a close friend of Henry and ultimately his chancellor. Um, and he, through his eyes, he sees this whole, this whole thing from the beginning and the end of um, Anne Boleyn. But it is a, a remarkable drama, really quite good. Wolf Hall. So among these other strong characters, this is, this is a human story and we're gonna track uh, several people and what they were doing at the time and how what they experienced and did affected this, this transformation. Cardinal Thomas Woolsey was an English archbishop, statesman and cardinal of the Catholic Church. When Henry became King of England in 15, 1509, Woolsey became the King's almoner Wolsey's affairs prospered and by 1514 become the controlling figure in virtually all matters of state. He also held important ecclesiastical appointments. These included the Archbishopric of York, the second most important role in the English church, and acting as papal legate. So he was the emissary from the Pope. His appointment as Cardinal by Pope Leo X in 1515 gave him precedence over all other English clergy. The highest political position Wolsey attained was Lord Chancellor. He was the lawyer and chief advisor of the king. In that position, he enjoyed great freedom and was often depicted as altar rex, or a, sort of a, a shadow king. Wolsey advised Henry VIII to seek the Pope's approval for an annulment from Catherine rather than just a divorce in order to maintain a better political status with Spain. He assured Henry that the Pope would grant it. In 1525, the French and English signed a peace treaty. Catherine was the aunt of German Emperor Charles V, who in 1527 had sacked Rome. By the next year, Henry and England were at war with Catherine's nephew, Charles. The emperor forbade Pope Clement VII to grant the annulment and Pope, afraid of further reprisals from the emperor, complied and there was no annulment granted. Imagine how things would happen if some of these circumstances never occurred. Well, an annulment is an official acknowledgement that there never was a marriage, that, that there was an impediment in the marriage that made it un unlawful from the beginning. Henry was not seeking a divorce, but an annulment based on the impropriety of the former Pope's earlier dispensation, founded in part in Henry's mind on the premise and stipulation he'd made about obtaining a male heir. Henry was outraged that the Pope was too afraid of Charles V to grant his annulment and that this should put his family's political future in doubt and even plunge England back into civil war. Besides all that, he wanted Anne Boleyn. Thomas Wolsey had set out to achieve the annulment that Henry wanted of his marriage to Catherine, citing the lack of male heirs as God's judgment, after failing to negotiate the annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine, Wolsey fell out of favor and was stripped of his governmental titles. He retreated to York to fulfill his ecclesiastical duties as archbishop, a position he nominally held but had neglected during his years in government. He was recalled to London to answer charges of treason, a very common charge used by Henry against ministers who simply fell out of favor and did not necessarily commit actual treason, but in any case, he died on the way from natural causes. Thomas More. Sir Thomas More, eventually venerated in the Roman calendar as Saint Thomas More, 
In fact, anytime you get an Anglican who joins Rome against us, they'll saint him somewhere along the line. He was an English lawyer, social philosopher, author, statesman, humanist, a great friend of Henry from 1529 to 1532. He served as Lord High Chancellor of England, the second highest political office in the land after Wolsey had been denounced. He was author of the book Utopia, Imagining a Political System in an Island State. More opposed, more, Thomas More, opposed the Protestant Reformation, directing polemics against the theology of Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and Tyndale. He prevented Lutheran books from coming to England from the continent. He arrested anyone holding Bibles in translation and Protestant works. He especially persecuted Tyndall, whose English Bible was the inspiration for the Coverdale and eventually much of the King James Version. Thomas More opposed Henry's separation from the Catholic Church, refusing to acknowledge Henry as supreme head of the Church of England and the annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. He actually refused to make a pu public judgment on these, neither giving consent nor refuting it. But Henry demanded his fealty. After refusing to take the oath of supremacy, Moore was convicted of treason and was executed. Actually before Tyndall, who was executed, whose conviction he had worked so hard to achieve. On his execution, he was reported to have said, I die the king's good servant and God's first. His courageous moment is memorialized in the play and movie, A Man for All Seasons. Very romanticized, I might say, but uh, he was a remarkable man. The Tyndale Bible used controversial translations of certain words that Moore considered heretical and sedition. For example, it used senior and elder rather than priest for the Greek presbyteros and used the term congregation instead of church. He also pointed out that some of the marginal glosses challenged Catholic doctrine. It was during this time that most of his literary polemics were given. He would blush to read them. In fact, um, don't read them out loud for the children. Moore could be pretty earthy. Many accounts circulated during and after Moore's lifetime regarding persecution of the Protestants in his time as Lord Chancellor. The 16th English, 16th English Protestant historian, 16th century English Protestant historian, John Fox, in his famous Fox's Book of Martyrs, claimed that Moore had often personally used violence or torture while interrogating heretics. Moore has not found a place in Anglican saints days somehow just in the Roman church. As the conflict over supremacy between the papacy and the king reached its apogee, Moore continued to remain steadfast in supporting the supremacy of the Pope as the successor of Peter over that of the King of England. Parliament's reinstatement of the charge of Primenir in 1529, it made it a crime to support in public or office the claim of any authority outside the realm, such as the papacy, to have legal jurisdiction superior in England to that of the king. In 1530, Moore refused to sign the letter by uh, the leading English churchmen and aristocrats asking Pope Clement VII to annul the marriage and also quarreled with Henry over heresy laws. In 1531, a royal decree requiring the clergy to take an oath of acknowledgement of the, the supreme head of the church, the bishops of the Convocation of Canterbury agreed to sign the oath, but only under threat of preliminary, and only after these words were added, as far as Christ law allows. This was considered to be the final submission of the clergy. Cardinal Fisher and some other clergy refused to sign. Henry purged most clergy who supported the papal stance from senior positions in the church. Moore continued to refuse to sign the oath of supremacy and did not agree to support the annulment of the marriage. However, he did not openly reject the king's actions and kept his opinions silent. But he resigned from his role as chancellor, remaining in Henry's favor despite his refusal for a time. But he refused to attend the coronation of Anne Boleyn as Queen of England, 
technically this was not an act of treason, but it was a refusal to attend and it was widely interpreted as a snub against Anne and Henry took action. In, 15, in 1534, Moore was asked to appear before a commission and swear his allegiance to the parliamentary act of succession. Moore accepted parliament's right to declare Anne Boleyn the legitimate queen of England, though he refused the spiritual validity of the king's second marriage. And holding fast to the teaching of papal supremacy, he steadfastly refused to take the oath of supremacy of the crown in relationship between the kingdom and the church in England. More furthermore, publicly refused to uphold Henry's annulment from Catherine. Regardless of the specific charges, the indictment related to violation of the Treasons Act of 1534, which declared it treason to speak against the king's supremacy. In any case, Moore lost his head. Now, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer is very central in all of this, and we all know his name because Cranmer is the author and contributor and compiler of our original prayer book. Thomas Cranmer was the man of the hour in turning a marital disaster and politically volatile issue around into what we now know as the English Reformation. Henry VIII was simply a faithful Catholic, opposed to continental Reformation ideas of both Luther and Calvin, certainly of Zwingli. But freedom was in the air and the political ugliness of the Roman Church, with its Pope wrapped in the power of the Spanish Emperor, recently scandalized by multiple claimants to the throne of Peter, set Henry's course politically against the papacy. And the result, after the Pope refused his lawsuit, was that England was set free, and his new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, was the Archbishop of those, which was the architect of those first few steps of freedom. Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine raised questions related to biblical prohibition in Le Le Leviticus against the marriage of a brother's wife. The couple married in 1509, suffered many miscarriages. We've talked about that. During those years, Wolsey, as Henry's chancellor, selected Cambridge scholars as diplomats, and he chose Cranmer to serve a role in the English embassy to Spain. Cranmer returned from Spain in 1527, and Henry interviewed him, approving of him greatly by all appearances. In 1529, Cranmer conferred with Cambridge associates about the idea of Henry seeking an annulment and suggested the suit in Rome be dropped and instead obtain a canvassed opinion of theologians from across Europe. Instead of trying for the Pope's approval, just get theologians to approve and use them. That was a very interesting idea and would challenge the supremacy of the papacy. Henry liked the idea. The new chancellor, Thomas More, may have also favored the plan. It's not known, but Henry did connect with theologians, excuse me, Cranmer connected with theologians and even reformers to gain their positive support for the measure of an annulment. In er early 1532, Cranmer became resident ambassador to Emperor Charles V. And while touring, he became familiar with Lutheran ideas, even to the point of taking a wife, though he was a priest. But despite his close association with the emperor, he was not able to persuade him to favor the annulment and thus subsequently released the Pope to grant it. While in Italy with Charles, Cranmer received word of his appointment as Archbishop of Canterbury, the office vacated by a death. Anne Boleyn had spoken for him and as she was being courted by Henry, he favored her idea as well. Henry was able to obtain papal approval of Thomas's appointment, the bulls arriving in 1533. Cranmer proceeded with the annulment arrangements, now especially due to Boleyn's pregnancy. Oops. Henry and Anne were married in secret in January 1533. Once Cranmer and Henry determined how to approach the English clergy regarding this irregular marital arrangement, Cranmer held the court proceedings regarding the annulment and invited Henry and Catherine, who did not appear or send proxy. Cranmer pronounced judgment that Henry's marriage to Catherine was against the law of God. He was never, in fact, married to her. This permitted the archbishop to acknowledge the new marriage to Anne and formalize it as a reality. Pope Clement V 
VII learned of this, and in outrage, he provisionally excommunicated Henry and his advisors, including Cranmer, unless he should repudiate the marriage to Anne. Henry kept Anne, and on the 7th of September, Anne gave birth to her sole child, Elizabeth. Cranmer baptized her immediately afterwards and acted as one of her grand godparents. The rift between England's church and that of Rome was official. <clears throat> Cranmer's theological views had evolved since his Cambridge days. He continued to support humanism. He renewed Erasmus' pension. In June of 1533, he had to prosecute a former reformer, John Frith, who denied the real presence. Cranmer attempted to have him change his views, but Frith was condemned to burn. Cranmer's appointments within his province showed his change in stance, however. Not all the older bishops accepted him. Some resisted his rights of visitation. Having much to offer as a liturgist, Cranmer lacked political clout. Thomas Cronmel, well, Henry's chief minister, was left to do the dirty work. A thousand days into the marriage of Anne, Henry had misgivings and began to court Jane Seymour. Anne was imprisoned, and Cranmer was forced to hear her confession before declaring her marriage to Henry null. Cranmer mourned her death. Henry, now titular head of the Church of England through his vice regent, created an initial list of 10 articles for the church. They are in summary, one, the Bible and the three ecumenical creeds are the basis of true Christian faith. Two, baptism imparts remission of sin and regeneration is necessary for salvation, may be done with infants, and rejects anabaptism. Three, penance, confession, and absolution are necessary to salvation. Four, the body and blood of Christ are really present in the Eucharist. Five, justification is by faith, but good works are necessary too. Six, images represent virtue, but are not objects of worship. Seven, saints are honored as examples of life and as furthering the prayers of the faithful. Eight, praying to saints is permissible and holy days should be observed. Nine, rites and ceremonies, clerical vestments, sprinkling holy water, ashes on Ash Wednesday are good and laudable. However, none has the power to forgive sin. And finally, 10, it's a good and charitable deed to pray for the dead, papal indulgences, or masses for the dead are to be rejected. So his premises were not at all uh, continental pure, uh, uh, Protestantism at all. They would have not liked any of these. Protests during the pilgrimage of grace opposed Henry's policies. What came to be known as the Bishop's Book was proposed in 1537. In its final form, it compli compiled the opinion of many clergymen on a great many topics. While it was distributed to be read from English pulpits, it gained only lukewarm support, even from the king, who would replace it with the king's book. Jane Seymour gave birth to the long-awaited son of Henry, Edward. Then she died soon after. In 1538, the king and Cromwell, and remember, don't confuse Thomas Cromwell with Oliver Cromwell a century later, they arranged with Lutheran princes to have detain, detailed discussions on forming a political and religious alliance with them. The Lutherans were delighted by this and they sent a joint delegation from various German cities. The talks dragged on with the Germans becoming weary despite the Archbishop's strenuous efforts. Philip Melanchthon was aware that he was admired by Henry and wrote to Henry's criticizing his views, in particular, his support of clerical celibacy. This clash against Reformation ended as Henry VIII was reestablished in his support of Cranmer and Cromwell, asking the former to write a preface for the Great Bible, the new English translation of 1539, directed by Cromwell. By now, Henry was marrying Anne Cleves, a German noblewoman, favored by Cromwell. The brief marriage ended in divorce, and Cromwell fell again to disfavored, eventually arrested and executed. Cranmer's position was strengthened and he even took political power at need. 
This included a disclosure by Cranmer to Henry that his newest wife, Catherine, was guilty of extramarital affairs for which he was executed February 1542. It was dangerous to be around this man. Jealousies brought enemy, enemies toward Cranmer in various plots, but Henry backed him and the opponents were themselves exposed. In this enhanced position, Cranmer now set about to reform the Church of England. The Book of Common Prayer. Cranmer, who we all know is a brilliant liturgist, compiled, compiled services that de derived from Catholic practices, presented the faith and worship of the Church of England in England, in English. The first official authorized service was the Exhortation and Litany, published in May 1544. Derived from previous Catholic practices, the new rites did not invoke the prayers of the saints. Cranmer performed his final duties for the king on 28th of January, 1547, when he gave a reformed statement of faith while gripping Henry's hand instead of the last rites. Cranmer mourned Henry's death, and it was later said that he demonstrated his grief by growing a beard. The beard was also a sign of his break with the past. On the 31st January, he was among the ex executors of the king's final will that nominated Edward Seymour as Lord Protector and welcomed the boy king, Edward VI. Now, Edward VI was the son of Henry VIII and Jane Seymour. He was crowned king at age nine. He was a figurehead only, the country ruled by two uncles, the Duke of Somerset and the Duke of Northumberland. Quite corrupt, the, English, the uncles ruined the country. They also favored Calvinist revisions for the church and influenced Cranmer to move the church toward reform status. The reforms took to destruction of sanctuaries, altars, and statues, a new iconoclasm and it wouldn't be the last. Changes in church life included the distribution of the mass now in two kinds again. Priests were permitted to marry. Cranmer's wife, kept in Holland, was able to come over to the channel and live with her husband. The first prayer book was issued. Under the regency of Seymour, the reformers were now part of the establishment. A royal visitation of provinces took place in August 1547, and each parish that was visited was instructed to obtain a copy of the homilies. This book consisted of 12 homilies, of which four were written by Cranmer, asserting the doctrine of justification by faith and attacking monasticism. Cranmer's Eucharistic views, which had already moved away from official Catholic doctrine, received another push from the continental reformers. The need for a complete liturgy for the church became evident. Initial meetings to start what would eventually become the 1549 Book of Common Prayer were held in September of 48. The list of participants can only be partially reconstructed, but it is known that the members were balanced between conservatives and reformers. These meetings were followed by a debate on the Eucharist in the House of Lords, which took place between 14th and 19th of December. Cranmer publicly revealed in this debate that he had abandoned the doctrine of the corporeal real presence and believed that the Eucharistic presence was only spiritual. Parliament backed the publication of the prayer book after Christmas by passing the Act of Uniformity in 1549. It then legalized clerical marriage. I'm happy about that. It is difficult to ascertain how much of the prayer book is Cranmer's personal composition Generations of liturgical scholars have been able to track down the sources that he used, however, including the Sarum ritual and several Lutheran sources. Cranmer is given the credit for the editor editorship and the overall structure of the book. We figure also so, things like the prayer of humble access and the prayer for purity are his work. They're excellent prayers. The use of the new prayer book was made compulsory on the 9th of June, 1549. This triggered a series of protests in Devon and Cornwall, where the English language was not yet in common usage, now known as the Prayer Book Rebellion. The uprising spread to other parts in the east of England. 
The Privy Council became divided when a set of dissident councillors banded together to oust Seymour. The, a bloodless coup d'etat resulted in the end of Seymour's protectorship on the 13th of October, 1549. Despite the support of religiously conservative politicians behind Dudley's coup, the reformers managed to maintain control of the new government and the English Reformation continued to consolidate its gains. Cranmer's role in politics was diminishing when in October of 1551, Seymour was arrested on charges of treason. This is not the king, this is a, the protectorate. In December, Seymour was put on trial and although acquitted of treason, he was judged guilty of felony and put to death in the next year. Even throughout this political turmoil, Cranmer worked simultaneously on three major projects in his reform program. The revision of canon law, a revision of the prayer book, and the formation of a statement of doctrine. The original Catholic canon law that defined governance within the church clearly needed revision. Cranmer formed a committee in December 51. He planned to draw together all the reformed churches of Europe under England's leadership to counter the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation. In March of 52, Cranmer invited the foremost continental reformers Bollinger, John Calvin, and Melanchthon to come to England and participate in an ecumenical council. The response was disappointing. Melanchthon did not respond. Bollinger stated that neither of them could leave Germany as it was riven by war between the emperor and the Lutheran princes. And while Calvin showed some enthusiasm, he said he was unable to come. But a breach between Cranmer and Dudley, the new regent, led to the canon's failure in the House of Lords. As in the first prayer book, the or origins and participants in the work of its revision are obscure, but it was clear that Cranmer led the project and steered its development. His shift toward more Protestant philosophy was quite apparent. The spiritual presence view was clarified by the use of entirely different words when the communicants are offered the bread and the wine. New rubrics noted that any kind of bread could be used and any bread or wine that remained could be used by the curate, thus disassociating the elements from any real presence. The new book removed any possibility of prayers for the dead, such as prayers implied support for a doctrine of purgatory. The Act of Uniformity 1552, which authorized the book's use, specified that it be exclusively used from the 1st of November. The final version was officially published at nearly the last minute due to Dudley's intervention. While traveling in the north of the country, he met the Scots reformer, John Knox. Impressed by his preaching, Dudley selected him to be royal chaplain and brought him south to participate in the reform projects. In a sermon before the king, Knox attacked the practice of kneeling during communion. On September 1552, the Privy Council stopped the printing of the new prayer book and told Cranmer to revise it. He responded with a long letter using an argument that it was for Parliament with the royal assent to decide changes in the liturgy. In October, the Council decided to keep the liturgy as, as it is and add the so-called black rubric, which explained that no adoration was intended when kneeling at communion. The origins of the 42 articles are equally obscure. As early as December of 49, the archbishop was demanding from his bishops subscription to certain doctrinal articles. In 1551, Cranmer presented a version of a statement to the bishops, but its status remained ambiguous. Cranmer did not devote much effort into developing the articles, most likely due to work in the canon law revision. He became more interested once in the hope for an ecumenical council to begin and begin to fade. By September of 52, draft versions of the articles were being worked on by Cranmer. When the 42 articles were finally published in May of 53, the title page declared that the articles were agreed upon by the convocation and were published by the authority of the king. This was not in fact the case and the mistake was likely caused by miscommunications between Archbishop Cranmer and the Privy Council. 
Cranmer complained about this to the council, but the authorities responded by noting that the articles were developed during the time of convocation, hence evading a direct answer. The council gave Cranmer the unfortunate task of requiring subscription to the articles from the bishops, many of whom opposed them, and pointed out the anomaly of the title page. It was while Cranmer was carrying out this duty that events unfolded that would render the subscriptions futile. Edward VI became seriously ill from tuberculosis and the counselors were told that he did not have long to live. While an effort to shore up the reformation was taking place, the council was working to convince several judges to put on the throne Lady Jane Grey, Edward's cousin and a Protestant, instead of Mary, Henry and Catherine's daughter and a Catholic. In June of 53, the king made his will, noting Jane would succeed him, contravening the Third Succession Act. Cranmer tried to speak to Edward alone, but he was refused, and his audience with Edward occurred in the presence of the counselors. Edward told him that he supported that what he wrote in his will. Cranmer's decision to support Jane must have occurred before the 19th of June, when royal orders were sent to convene the convocation for the recognition of the new succession. At first, Mary acted warily in enacting change. She was made the queen. I don't think I made that clear. Uh, she got to be the queen, Mary. The abuses of the Duke of Northumberland and extreme Protestantism with its own executions offended the English mind. They would have submitted to her Catholicism, but if she had, if only she'd remained moderate. But Mary was an extreme counter-reformation Catholic and demanded total submission to the Pope. Mary's cousin, Emperor Charles, pressed her to insist on total submission to the Pope and to marry his son, Philip, King of Spain. England became officially Roman Catholic once more. Mary filled the court with Spaniards and began to repress Protestants. Mary's repressive tactics earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Reginald Pole was sent to become the new papal legate he absolved England of the sins of the last years. At Cranmer's death, he became the new Archbishop of Canterbury. Some clergy fled to Europe, sheltered by other Protestants. All married clergy lost their parishes and orders. Some single clergy already ordained under the new church ordinal were reordained as Roman priests. Pole, however, accepted the English ordinal and did not force any who had been ordained under the Church of England to be reordained under the old Latin rite. This is important because it makes later claims by the popes that invalidate Anglican orders to be moot. By mid-July, there were serious provincial revolts in Mary's favor and support for Jane and the council fell. As Mary was proclaimed queen, her opponents imprisoned, no action was taken against the archbishop. The 8th of August, he led Edward's funeral according to the rites of the prayer book. During these months, he advised others to flee England, but he himself chose to stay. Reformed bishops were removed from office and the Catholic clergy had their old positions restored. But Thomas Cranmer didn't go down without a fight. He was now a convinced Protestant and denied rumors of having reauthorized the Catholic mass at Canterbury Cathedral. The doctrine and religion by our said sovereign Lord King Edward VI is more pure and according to God's word than any that hath been used in England these thousand years, he wrote. Mary's government viewed this as sedition. He stood before the Star Chamber on 14 September and from there went to the Tower. Cranmer was tried in November of 1553, was found guilty and condemned to execution. In March of the next year, the Privy Council ordered him and several allies to Oxford to await yet another trial for heresy. He remained in Bocardo prison for 17 months. At the trial under papal jurisdiction, its verdict to be used, issued from Rome, Cranmer admitted material facts presented, but denied heresy or treachery. He was finally deprived of archbishop status and granted permission to sentence him under secular laws. 
In his final days, Cranmer's circumstances changed, which led to several recantations. Removed from prison and treated as a guest, he softened. Cranmer submitted himself to the authority of the king and queen and recognized the pope as head of the church. On the 14th of February, 1556, he was degraded from holy orders and returned to Bucarda. The date of Cranmer's execution was set, eliciting a fifth statement, a true recantation. Cranmer repudiated Luther and Zwingli, fully accepted Catholic theology, including papal supremacy and transubstantiation, and stated that there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. He announced his joy of returning to the Catholic faith, asked for and received sacramental absolution, and participated in the Mass. So Cranmer's burning was postponed, and under normal practice of canon law, he should have been absolved. Mary decided that no further postponement was possible. His last recantation was on the 18th of March. Despite canon law stipulating that recanting heretics be reprieved, Mary was determined to make an example of Thomas Cranmer. He was told that he would, not be, he would be able to make a final recantation in public during a service at the university church. He submitted the written speech in advance. At the, public, at the pulpit on the day of his execution, he ended his sermon unexpectedly, deviating from that script. He renounced the recantations that he had written or signed with his own hand since his degradation and he stated that in consequence, his hand would be punished by being burned first. He then said, and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrine. As the flames drew around him, he fulfilled his promise by placing his right hand into the heart of the fire while saying that unworthy hand. His dying words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So what had been born? Was an Anglican church a reality or a stillbirth? What was the church of England? And who was to define it from the, that point of forward? There were dark days ahead, surely. What had been resolved? I'm going to pop the, uh, the screen into multiple view and uh, you can all un unmute yourself uh, if you want uh, you got any opinions or ideas or questions about that you see your assignments we got several readings but we got a couple of weeks to take that in don't worry about not uh, getting it all done this week the discussion question is the Anglican Church just another Protestant church argue this from all that you know uh, just a couple just a couple hundred words is fine um, it would maybe seem so you know I, and I've said this uh, elsewhere often I've thought about the, the beginnings of the Anglicanism and, and the idea that Henry sh should have kicked it off it's embarrassing I mean it doesn't sound like we're organized around any kind of central principle or idea it's this terrible story but in a weird way and if we think we can see God moving in this uh, it created an environment okay discounting all of these people and their various ideas there was an environment in which the Catholic Church of all time, 15 centuries old in England, could suddenly become uh, able to look at the issues at hand and apart from politics and apart from other things, uh, see this and surgically try to get a perfect church, try to get what it needed. And it was pushed by the Calvinists and it was pushed by the Catholics and it was pushed this way and that way. But ultimately, it came free to be able to look and see it. So it didn't start with an objective like Lutheranism did or Calvinism did, an objective to do this thing. Uh, rather, it was an existing church that was able to look at itself again freely, ultimately, and decide for a new course of, of action and a new way to be. And uh, in this odd way, like I said, the beginning was a, a train wreck or a strange bunch of accidents, but and certainly a story of strong people but uh, what ultimately resulted was a, a church that can be called purely, truly Catholic, and yet not with the aberrations of the Roman church. What do you all say about that? Your grace. Yeah. Abel. 
I see some some similarities there that especially some of the freedoms that came with the church kind of organically across England coming out. And in some ways, I see that as having some of the best of both worlds with reformed theology and being able to look at abuses in the church and its theology that needed to change, but not having to, you know, throw everything out and show how it was different from the Catholic. And then also on the other side that, you know, we could go back to the fathers and see what was truly Catholic and needed to stay and maintain that uh, without kind of having to argue how that was Protestant. And one of the, the best examples I can think of with this on the, the Roman side, you know, at least in the present, is when they try to explain uh, sacraments in the way how they would work with reformed ideas that a, a sacrament delivers forgiveness and to try and jump through the, the backflips it takes to get from marriage as a sacrament to somehow delivering forgiveness is kind of interesting. Very good. Anybody else? Thank you, Abel. It's sort of like a uh, trial and error, trying to find out who we were by trying this and trying that, making a lot of mistakes, but learning from them and not having some sort of an overarching structure to make sure that you stayed in that mistake and could not change from it. Uh, it's free to screw up and then change directions. We got a few minutes. Yes, but I think it was also a lot of freedom to debate. You know, where on the continent, it seemed like if there was a, an idea outside of the current accepted status quo, there was a great hue and cry of heresy and, you know, burn them at the stake. But in the Anglican Reformation, it seemed like there was a great deal of uh, ability to bring the issues out in the public and to debate them and see what the, the truth of the matter was instead of, you know, having one, one opinion that was overwhelming. It's still a monarchy. You're, you're right. It's still a monarchy. And as in the European nations, uh, the king or queen sets the religion for the, for the nation in that, back in that time. And as such, you know, uh, Henry was a little hard to define. Edward was clearly on the Protestant side, Mary completely on the Catholic side. Elizabeth comes in and tries to settle everything and, and result. But, um, but you're right. I mean, I think that there was, at least without too many reprisals, the ability for the various sides to state their cases and debate it freely. Uh, to, to a certain great extent, at least certainly more than many other nations in, in Europe. Good, anybody else got a thought or a question? I found it interesting to look at Henry VIII's 10 points of faith, yeah. uh, which are very close to ours with the exception of the corporal real presence and the issue of praying to saints. And I'm also, uh, reminded of what I have told uh, people say, what, what are you Anglicans anyway? And I say, Catholics without a Pope, <laughs> because I, I can't think of anything quicker. And those familiar uh, with Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, practice, or at least free Vatican II, uh, yeah. get that almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah, unless they think the Catholics are the, the devil, and then that's, 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 you can't have a discussion after that. They don't get it. Uh, I remember Bishop Morris saying, uh, you know, if we lost this Anglican way, he would, he, he could side with the Catholics except for all the things that the Orthodox say against them. He, he agrees with the Orthodox and he would go with the Orthodox except for all the things that the Catholics say against them and he agrees there with the Catholics. So, uh, interesting. I don't know if any of you ever considered if we lost this whole shoot match and there was nowhere else to go, where would you go? I, I, I don't want to face that question. I really, 
I, I would rather not. Um, if we had an apostolic succession, we would manage something, I think. Yeah. And I think we, we do. do as well. Yeah. We do, you're right. The bishops still have the charism. Yep. If they killed us all, then that would be different. All right. But as long as one bishop is left, we can keep going. Very true. And we will. I also found the conditioning uh, of an Episcopalian upbringing in the 50s uh, stood me well when I finally understood the nature of grace and salvation, which was not particularly on the course uh, uh, syllabus uh, for the youngsters. We were what just was supposed your, to, what to was your home church parish? and be good. What was your home parish down there, Don? I was in Massachusetts, Massachusetts. at uh, Christ Church Needham Mass. Harold Chase was uh, the rector there for many years. A very enjoyable friend and preacher, uh, but as to the actual spiritual education, uh, it just went right by me. Uh -huh. It took me until I was almost 40 uh, to come. I came back to faith around 1980, but to come back to Anglican Catholic principles. Uh, it took me that long. In Massachusetts, were they a fairly low church? As we, uh, we were, we were a suburban parish, fairly large and fairly wealthy. Uh, we had superb music and choir, uh, and that tended to drown out any attention uh, to the actual liturgy. <laughs> I never knew what they were doing at the altar. No one told us. <laughs> I think the big secret is that the Catholics were changed by the Protestants and the Protestants were changed by the Catholics and they're all too proud to admit it. You're right. Yeah, as we'll see when we study the, uh, the Counter-Reformation, uh, the Reformation was happening, caused the Romans to, to crystallize and, and, and harden down the doctrines that they had previously allowed to be a little bit fluid. And really, really, they created themselves a new denomination at that time, at the same time as the English were trying to find their way. So if there was ever a way back into the Catholic Church, you'd never find it because it, it changed there in the midst of the 16th century. It changed in that they froze around these doctrines that they had been erroneously pursuing, and now they were adamant about it. It became hard hard-edged. There was no way back in. Not for if us. we could unify around the creeds, especially the Nicene, uh, it wouldn't make much difference who was in charge as long as we had that faith and shared it and denominations might have less meaning. There are those that believe it, there are those that practice it, and there are those that don't. How many bodies of Christ are there? Does Christ have more than one body? <laughs> he had two natures. Two natures. I didn't ask you that. I know. He had one body. <laughs> it's in Scripture. It says it's one body. So we can say we are of one body with the Roman Catholic Church. They believe that same Nicene Creed, as you, as you said rightly. So we understand that that is that. The, the church is everybody who gets to heaven. You know, ultimately, we can look back and see it all very clearly. Right here and now, we can't so well. So, yeah. I like C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce with the, uh, the saved around uh, a silver chess table, watching themselves being uh -huh. moved in their previous lives. Oh, that very closing scene, right? Yeah, the very end of it. Followed by an air raid. <laughs> That's right. And him waking up from his dream. Yeah, that was a lovely way to end that. He did that so good. It's one of, one of my favorite books of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, we're out of time. God bless you all. Start your reading and uh, keep up the discussions. If you've got, well, I, I sent you Grafton, so you have no excuse. That's a, He's got a wonderful section on the Reformation in there in England. And uh, if you've got see your ear of the body, there's a section on it in there that's also very instructive. But uh, you've got Gonzalez and McGrath to keep going in. And I bless you. And 
Archbishop, would you offer us a closing benediction? Sure, thank you. The Lord be with you. And with, with thy spirit. Let us pray. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you all. God Bye, bless everybody. You. God bless.